like obviously I wanted to play, but my best position was center half. But I wasn't ready to play center half. So, you know, even when I went to all the shot, I had to learn the game really, I suppose. <laughs> So, Adam, firstly, thank you for, for being here, mate. I appreciate Morris, it. Thanks for having me. Uh, to get us started, mate, um, in your opinion, what are the three most important attributes needed to be a professional footballer in the modern game? Um, I'd probably start with hard work. I think um, you've got to dedicate your, your whole life to becoming a, a professional and um, you've got to obviously sacrifice a lot along the way as, as you grow up and um, yeah I think if, you, if you're the hardest worker in the room or in the team then you've always got a chance um, other than that I'd probably say um, it's a tricky one uh, confidence actually I think confidence is a big one I think I probably struggled with that when I was from probably like 18 to like 20 like for just for like a couple of years and um it wasn't until like some I knew someone would believe in me and and told me how good I was that I actually believed it and then started to um show what I could actually do um so I think yeah self belief is a it's a massive one um I'm, I've known players that you know they can they've they've got all the belief in the world and they can give the ball away every time they get it and then um, they keep trying things and then they'll score and um, yeah everyone loves them because you know they score the goals and, and stuff like that so um, yeah that's a big one um, the third one struggling here um, but you're under a bit of pressure straight away yeah um, uh, I'll let you off talk yeah, to me, me um, off, talk to me a little bit about just as you mentioned there that those eight years from 18 years old to 20 where you you talked about potentially suffering from a lack of confidence yeah so um i broke into the first team when i was really young so i was training with the first team in the championship at portsmouth from like 16 so i was like i was a first year scholar i'd been training full time for like a month and then i was training with the first team um so it was really early i made my debut just after i turned 17 um so i was always in or around the first team squad um then I played sort of 20 games the next season in League One. And then after that, I didn't really play for like two years, two and a half years. Um, like always in and out of the team. Like I might be on the bench for a few games and I might come on for 20 minutes or start a game and then be out of, out of the team again. So never had like a run of games. And um, I was always playing like out. Like I was never playing centre-back then. Um and obviously, I went on loan to Aldershot to play centre back, which which helped massively. Um, but yeah, I, I really struggled because I used to get quite a lot of stick from the fans at Pompey um, when I because I, I used to be playing like right back and left back. Um, and like when I first broke into the team, it was all good. Like I didn't mind doing it. Like obviously, I just wanted to play. Um, but then like when things aren't going so well, it's it can get tough. And like you know, like fans are like at Pompey, like they're they're right on you and. Um, yeah, like you can hear, <laughs> you can hear every word they're saying. <laughs> and now I was getting pelters. Um, so I think that, that, um, that I struggled with that, I think. And then it wasn't until um, Andy Orford left and then Gary Waddock and Paul Hardiman took over. We had four games left of the season. I hadn't, hadn't played since like the start of the season properly. Um and then they threw me in at centre back, and that's like the first time I played centre back for Portsmouth. Um, and I, I was at contract that summer. Um, I knew like the new manager would be watching, so I knew I had to like this is like now or never. Otherwise, I'd I'd have definitely been in non league or like not got not got club. Um, so yeah, I played really well them last four games, and then from there, like my confidence just grew, and um, Paul Cook came in. And, he would he would tell me how good I was and, and 
things like that and it, it really helped and then from there I've not really looked back I suppose is there um is there anything that you can remember from those four game that four game period um with the two guys Waddock and, and Andy Orford you've just spoken about there that sticks in your memory as to, to how they helped you um no, I think they just they just like trust I think they trusted me and they they like they knew my ability they knew my potential um and I yeah they they just like I I didn't feel nervous going out to play like I I was just playing my own game I wasn't like worried about what someone was saying on the side and stuff I was just playing playing my own game and um like obviously it was crunch time I knew I had to do it like if if not I would have I would have been released and I would have been scrambling for a club probably. So there was probably a bit of that in there as well. But yeah, I'd just say it, like they just gave me like the, the confidence to go out and, and play my own natural game and um, that that definitely helped. I personally, like I, I've suffered with, with sort of performance anxiety and, and feeling under pressure to play well sort of yeah. for my whole life really. Um, so that resonates with me. I can relate to you in, in that respect. But yeah. for anybody listening or, or watching that suffers with confidence problems that, you know, you're obviously a, an exceptionally gifted player, yeah. but in that period of time found it difficult. What sort of, a, you know, have you got any advice for, for people suffering with confidence issues that could help them? It's hard to say, isn't it? Like, it's, it's easy for me to say, like, you've just got to believe in yourself. But obviously when you, you're low on confidence, like, that's the hardest thing to do. Um, but no one else is going to do it for you. So at the end of the day, you have got to just... Um, be narrow-minded, I suppose, and, and just be selfish and try and think about yourself. Um, because, yeah, like, if if you're not doing it, someone else will do it for you and take your spot, basically. So, yeah, be selfish and um, just don't don't listen to what other people think, really. Because it, as soon as you do, like, if you do that your whole life, then you're always going to be up against it. You're always going to be struggling and... Um, there'll always be someone that will tell you what you don't want to hear. So, yeah, just uh, selfish and narrow-minded. So when you were 16 years old, I think you made your debut as a 17-year-old, uh, yeah. right? But when you were 16-year-old and when you started to be involved in first-team training um, and match day experiences, what do you think it was about you at that age that managed to progress so quickly? Because being a 16-year-old now involved in first-team is, is pretty rare. Yeah. Um, well, I think, obviously, I had the ability... Um, yeah, obviously I was like technically like gifted and um, I worked hard. Um, to be fair, I remember when I used to train with the first team, the squad back then was really good. Like we, you're talking about a championship team, championship yeah, there's some team big players with like a big wage bill, big players that have played in the Premier League most of their lives and stuff. Um, and I remember Herman Horridison, he used to like, obviously he was crazy, absolutely crazy. Um, he used to call me the voice, like, because I in training, like, I wouldn't shut up. Like, I'd always be wanting the ball and screaming for the ball. And like, obviously I'd, I'd to be fair, I didn't really care. Like I'd, when we were training and doing five O's and stuff, I'd be screaming at someone to like, follow the man or like, left shoulder, right shoulder, things like that. And, like it, that definitely helped because like he obviously used to give me a bit of stick calling me the voice but that's sort of what you need when you go up with the first thing you need to show that you've got like a bit of character and um you're not you know you're not scared to be how you would be if you were with your 16s or your your 18s like you would uh, like your mates so um yeah that that definitely helped but yeah obviously i, I started training with them like sh straight away which was I obviously never expected that. Um, even when away with them, we went to Spain to play Real Betis um, in the international break uh, in September because the game got cancelled. It was meant to be pre-season. It got cancelled. So we went over there and like, that was like massive for me. Like, there was like four of us that went, I think like two first year pros and Sam Magri who was a year above me. Um, and that was like, being in and around them boys, it was, it was just like mental, like so young, literally 16. I've just come out of school, mate. It was, <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but yeah, obviously it's, it's hard these days, especially like at the top level to, to play. Um, and like with like all the, the academy systems and that now with the 23s, like they're a bit more protected and they, they sort of have to like work their way up. So it is, it's different, definitely different now. 
you've uh, you've obviously got long lasting memories of how Herman Horidas treated you in training. Um, but how would you now at your age, still young man, twenty six years old? So I think uh, Horidas must have been a bit older. Yeah. But how would you, you know, treat a, a sixteen year old coming to a first team environment now? Um, yeah, I think you've just got to try and welcome him in, like try and give him a bit of stick. I think that's important. I think um, like you want to have a bit of banter with someone and give them a bit of shit if you have to um, because it, it breaks the ice a little bit and maybe doesn't make them feel less nervous I suppose um, you know, I think it's, that's gone from the game a little bit yeah, def it's days. definitely gone from the game yeah but like you know it's like when when the kid comes up they're nervous and well some of them aren't nervous these days because that, that has changed definitely um, sometimes like kids coming up can like they won't be busting their balls, you know, and sometimes you just want to shake them because they've got such a good opportunity to train with the first team and that's where you show what you're about and some of them are just, you know, they're not working 100% or they don't look like they're working 100% at least. So it, it, it that can be frustrating because obviously they've all got a lot of ability because they're, for Brighton, for instance, say like they're at a Premier League club with um, in the 23s or whatever and, you just want to half shake them sometimes, but um, yeah, I think just try and welcome them in, let make them feel um, comfortable, and um, yeah, that's it really. Something that you've mentioned already, especially like obviously about your Portsmouth career, mm. is that you started off playing fullback. That when you first were exposed to the first team, it was right back, left back, um, and I've actually been speaking to a lot of people recently about this how in youth development and sort of like early teenage or latter teenage years, people don't seem to end up in the position that they do when they're a kid. Um, that for whatever reasons, their, their strengths and weaknesses become more apparent as they get older and they settle into a certain position. Mm. What was it about growing up as a fullback? And did you always have in your mind that you wanted to play centre-back, that that's, that's where you wanted to end up? Yeah, I think I, I played centre-back like all my like life until like 15 maybe yeah 15 because when we were 15 we used to have to play with like the under 16s and I was awful then like I was physically way behind everyone else like there was proper blokes there then I was 15 like gangly so skinny like not like filled out or anything um so I got shifted to like full back because I couldn't handle playing center back against like big Bloke, like blo they were blokes effectively um and then yeah 16s I played full back again a bit I think it was just because I was like comfortable on the ball as well and I, and I quite liked going forward with it as well um and then obviously when you get like into the first team you're playing anyway when you just want to play um and that was half my downfall um because like obviously I wanted to play but my best position was centre half, but I wasn't ready to play centre half. So, you know, even when I went to all the shot, I had to learn the game really, I suppose. Um, and then went back to Pompey, and then I went back to full back again. So it it was it sort of it didn't work out how it should have really. But like I was in the team, so I wasn't really complaining. Um, it was only like when I wasn't in the team, I was like, I need to be playing centre half, and then. Luckily, I got when I got back in. That's where I did play, and that's um, where I've ended up since. I've, you know, maybe last season I went full back a couple of times for like the last ten minutes um, in like a back five. So um, I've done that a couple of times. But yeah, obviously centre half's my my position, and um, I think it's good that it's good that you've got that to your um, to your armory. I suppose like when you're young, especially to play other positions, learn the game a bit. Um, to be fair even at Bristol I've, the last sort of month of the season I played centre mid quite a bit holding mid um, that was a blow <laughs> <laughs> that was tough um, literally it's it's mad how different the game is and you've got your back to goal like when you're getting the ball from the centre half yeah. instead of from the keeper it's crazy um, but yeah that it's it's all to help you really if you can you know play different position it, it can help you but it can also be can also hold you back at the same point because you're not sort of nailed down that one position people especially young players going through that experience of trying to figure out 
how their strengths and weaknesses obviously linked to a position on the pitch. Like how how did you manage to how did you decide when you were young that you wanted to be a defender? Like was that your decision or or was it a coach's? I don't really know to be honest. I think when I first joined the team, um, it was in Chichester and like one of my best mates now, he was a striker and he was scoring like fifty goals a season. And then we had a another guy who was in midfield and he was also scoring like fifty a season. And then there was me at the back. So I sort of just fit into that because they were always the ones that were scoring all the goals. And I was the one that was like feeding them the ball, I suppose. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've always I've always sort of been a defender. So it's never, I, I don't ever really know if I made that decision or someone else made it for me. I'm not really too sure. But yeah, that's just how it ended up. You talk about, already from a young age feeding people and obviously it's a big part of your game now to to play out from the back something that you've that you've grown into really well um you've also spoken about that period of time at Aldershot where you had to learn as you say how to defend and we obviously spent time playing together I think it was yeah. like the probably the most unphysical two centre-backs that the, conf <laughs> that the conference has ever seen yeah both both thought we were players but just kept absolutely booming it every time we got anywhere near it um <laughs> I'm interested to know, like, for that period of time that you were learning uh, how to defend and you were in an environment at Aldershot where we weren't being asked to play, even though, we, you know, I knew you were capable of and hopefully yeah. you thought I might have been. Yeah. Um, but how did you build your philosophy of how you wanted to play football and how difficult was it for you to hold on to that when being asked to play in a different way? Yeah, it's tough. I think even after that, like, obviously when I went from Portsmouth to Ipswich, um, under Mick McCarthy, obviously, they used to want me to, like, pick and choose when I did it, I suppose. Like, if I wanted to go on, like, a little run, it'd always be, like, you've got to pick your moments. And, you know, if I picked the wrong moment, I'd I'd hear about it. I'd get absolutely battered. Um, but, yeah, I think for probably two years at Ipswich, like, it was more about, learning how to defend I suppose um, rather than doing what I'm probably naturally better at which is bringing the ball out and passing and maybe dribbling with it um, so I think that did help me to be fair um, because it gave me that sort of foundation where I had to just you know focus on doing the basics well um, and then the rest sort of takes care of itself um, and yeah, I suppose that's that's happened everywhere I've been, like even at Bristol. Um maybe when I thought about trying to play too much I wouldn't do the basics well, whereas when I think about doing the basics well, like the other side just comes naturally. So um that probably took care of itself in the end. So in your opinion, what you know, what approach can people take if they're playing in environments that may not suit them or may not suit how they want to play. What can what can people do to help themselves? I think you've just got to try and adapt um, because you know it's not always going to be situations where it's all on your terms or you know what you always want to do. I think um, yeah, you've just got to try and adapt to every situation and try and learn from it. Um, like I've not always been able to get the ball off the keeper from a goal kick and try and play out. Um, it's been obviously like I say when I was at Ipswich and um, even like times at Brighton when we were up against a team that presses high, you know we might take the, take that out of their game and just go along from a goal kick and then play when whenever's right to do so. So yeah, it's all about adapting to what's in front of you, I suppose. You you've talked about already. You mentioned a couple of times about when you went back to Portsmouth from Aldershot and. Um, the confident stuff that you felt in, in that period of time, the two and a half years where you were possibly in and out of the team. Um, in that period of time, you go from being squad player to really important first team player. Um, I want to put a problem to you. I'm a squad player and I want to become a first team player. How do I do it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, for me, when I see like players now, like, that aren't necessarily the first team player, like the first eleven in training and stuff. I like I know for a fact like if I've ever been dropped in training, I will like 
bust my balls. Like, I'll be screaming at people. I'll be, like, 110, like, literally, like, overboard. Try and get in the gaffer's face, like, not in the gaffer's face, but, like, try and get in his, like, thoughts. And you'll be like, Jesus, he's, he's been at it. And it, it does work. You do see it a lot. Um if you're if you're at it and training every single day, and obviously not every day, you you might not have the quality every day or have your best session every day. But if you're trying your absolute utmost and demanding a lot from other people, it it doesn't go unnoticed. And I think that that really stands out. Like even like running, if you're running after the game, like some like I see some boys that you know don't put it in and stuff and. You just think, well, like if you're doing that, then you're never really gonna break into that eleven, and um, it can be frustrating. Obviously, it's frustrating whenever you're not playing. It's like the worst thing ever, isn't it? But um, yeah, for me, it just it would just be train every day, literally like it's your last game, and um, try and get in the gaffer's gaffer's thought process. I suppose. So, was there any moments that you can remember during that period of time where you felt? your weight shift as a player from, you know, being in the squad to, to being a first team on the team sheet? Um, yeah, but to, to be fair, when I was, so after them four games, obviously the season ended and then Paul Cook came in. Um, and also Matt Clark, he signed Matt Clark from Ipswich on loan. And for the first 12 league games, I was on the bench, didn't, didn't play the first 12 league games. Um, I think I came on maybe two or three um, but I'd only played I'd play like the, the Carabao Cup games and we played I think we played Derby we beat them so I did well in that game then we played Reading we lost to them I think or the, yeah the other way around whatever and I played really well and I just remember like I was training so well every day like so well and <laughs> like Paul Cook was like really honest I remember him saying this to me so many times like got to get you in my team I just I just can't admit I, I need you in my team because you're like you're doing so well I need you in my team I had to wait 12 league games so it was probably like I don't know October before I actually got in the team properly um, so I had to be patient with it like it wasn't just like I turned up and I was straight in the team like when he came in he obviously signed Matt Clark as his player signed Christian Burgess as his player so they started the season and then I had to work and work to try and get in the team. And then when I got in the team, I stayed in the team for the rest of the season. So, it, yeah, it all worked out in the end. So you think reflecting on that, that period of time that you were training hard whilst waiting for your opportunity, if you hadn't have trained at that intensity during that time, you, you probably wouldn't have taken your chance and stayed in the team. Yeah, and, that, and to be fair, thinking about it now, like the season before, like we've spoke about, I wasn't playing. And I, I never trained like how I would now. Or like how I did after that like I was never like thinking about how I need to train well here I need to I need to try and play on Saturday um I, I let it pass me by effectively for like quite a long time probably um and that's probably why I didn't play and I wasn't playing so it wasn't just like oh he's not picking me like it was obviously because I wasn't playing well I was low on confidence I wasn't to, in top form per se like even in training and stuff so um yeah it's not always been like other people's fault it's sort of it's like you got to look at yourself as well so yeah that's, uh, I'd say that's it yeah a lot of people that I've spoken to already especially you know talking to guys who are playing at the top level are all so honest about how taking responsibility ends up being a positive thing like you eliminate excuses from from allowing other people to to be at fault and, and usually positive things happen off the back of that. Yeah, definitely. I think there's plenty of players that, you know, it's never their fault, is it? So yeah, that that can be frustrating. You know, you try and give a bit of advice and, um, you know, yeah, but he didn't, <laughs> you know, things like that. And it's like, it's like, no, I'm just trying to help. Like, I'm just trying to say, like, do this, do that. Um, that is quite frustrating and that happens all the time. That happens every day, like, every day in training or every game that happens um but at the end of the day the you know you've got to look at yourself and like you say take responsibility for, for whatever you're trying to do and um yeah at, at the end of the day it all stops with you and that's that's all you can affect so how did that shift in in weight in terms of your um 
you know, your role within the within the first team at Portsmouth during that time. Becoming a first team player, how, what did that do to your lifestyle? And by lifestyle, I mean football lifestyle. So your, you know, your mentality, your training habits, how you lived your life. Well, yeah, that's funny to say because funny to say that because like like I say, when I was when I'm talking about like the year before or well, the year the year my contract was coming up to the, to uh, finishing, I wasn't living right. Like I'd eat shit. I wouldn't eat properly. I did, to be fair, like my knowledge of stuff, like nutrition and what's right wasn't good. But like I was living at home. Mate, I'd go to the shop, I'd get like chocolate sweet. I'd eat it every night. I'd eat like a bag of dairy milk nibbles like every night and some squashies every night, like without fail. And like my body fat was probably a lot higher. Um, so I definitely wasn't performing at like the optimum level and then when Paul Cook came in um things really changed at the club and like we used to actually do body fats so like if your body fat was high it's, it's half embarrassing like you don't want it to be high like when you've got lads that are like six percent seven percent you're like you want to be one of them lads you know what I mean and if you're like 10 11 percent that's not good is it so I think that definitely changed with me then and that summer I worked really hard that summer and I I tried to learn as much as I could in terms of nutrition and stuff like that and what meals I should be eating what I shouldn't be eating what what I need to be doing to improve and yeah and then that massively helped with my performance on the pitch um and then like I made I, I went back again when I went to Ipswich my my nutrition wasn't great. Like we never had body fat. We'd had body fats done once a season at Ipswich and that was in pre-season. Um, and then after that, it was like, like you do whatever you wanted. Like they weren't sports, sports science focused or anything there. So it was like, you could get away with it. So like you could be lean when you return in pre-season and then you could literally put on as much weight as you wanted. No one would probably know. And obviously that wouldn't help your performance. And, I got injured too much at Ipswich. Like I had a couple of ankle injuries, to be fair. Um, but then I had probably three or four muscle injuries, and to be fair, I probably put it down to like not living right and how I should have been. And then, like I say, when I went to Ips, when I went to Bristol from there, everything's like it's like another level, and it's like every month body fats. Uh, everything's done properly like sports science wise and stuff so you can't actually get away with like letting yourself go or not living properly and that's the same at Brighton now like it's every two or three weeks and um, obviously we've got nutritionists and stuff and um, literally everything is provided for you so there's literally no excuses. Can you give people who you know may not have been exposed to a professional football environment an insight into just what um, being told you've got, got to have your body fats doing does does oh, for you. Your heart sinks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get told you've got your body fats and the night before you might have had a, I don't know, a takeaway or something and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that still happens now, to be fair. And, like, I'm not sitting here saying, like, I don't eat, eat anything bad, but I just know when to do it. And, like, throughout the week, I'll be, like, really good and then, leading up to the game really good and then obviously after the game I might treat myself and stuff and enjoy a bit of ice cream or whatever um, but yeah the body fat is, is a tricky <laughs> one because obviously at the end of the day like taking responsibility you know at the end of the day if you've put on a bit or you're not as lean as you were a month ago or from what you've been eating and what you've been doing with your life so um, yeah it can be a it can be a nervous time when you when they got the calipers out that's for sure Um I'm going to try and paint a picture for people listening about your the period of time you spend at Portsmouth. Two contrasting seasons where you're, you know, an important first team player. But one season you avoid relegation from League Two, which is a big deal. And then the next season you're in a playoff team that's obviously looking to be successful. And by painting the picture, I mean that in Portsmouth, as many cities, but we've grown up obviously in this area, both supporters of the football club, it's enormous what football can do for the city. Like if, yeah. if the team's positive, everything's, everything's okay. If the team's negative, the whole, the whole feeling of the city is, is down. Yeah. Um, the football team in itself has enormous 
responsibility to the city to you know to to keep everybody happy mm -hmm. so during that period of time and you've spoken about it about you know receiving a little bit of abuse yeah uh, um especially in that season where you just avoid relegation from league two which you know i'm sure everybody's aware would have been you know a ridiculous thing to happen mm -hmm. i want to know how you dealt with the pressure of being in such a negative environment um to play and how you dealt with receiving you know that that sort of negative um, feedback from supporters? I didn't deal with it well at all. Like on Twitter and that, I used to get hammered. Like, Did you go searching yeah. for it? Yeah, and like, that's what I mean. I used to go searching for it. And like, I used to get tagged in a lot as well. And like, I remember one game, mate, I wasn't even playing. Like, I wasn't even playing. And down at Butts won't mind me saying this, but we obviously keep playing yeah. Butts as well, yeah. Butts was, we played late in Orient away. And it probably would have been, it would have been that season, yeah. Played late in Orient away. We lost 1-0, I think. Butts has tried to pass back from, like, near the halfway line. Under hit it. Strikers run through, scored. We lost the game. I was on the bench, didn't play. Got on the bus after. And then, like, Butts has had, like, a bit of abuse as well. And one of the comments, I'll never forget it. <laughs> it was brilliant, to be fair. One of the comments was, like, don't worry, Dan, but, like, you'll never be as bad as Adam Webster like this. Like, and it was just, I'm like oh, I ain't even play. <laughs> like, I'm getting belters here. I'm not even fucking kicked the ball tonight. Um, but, yeah, I used, to, I used to probably go searching for it. And, like, I don't know, just because I came through the academy, I still see it now, like, people with Pompey fans and stuff. Just because I came through the academy, I probably thought I'd get a bit more respect than than I did and I never did until probably the season after when people actually saw that I could play um, but yeah I still see like even like Ben Close now like Ben Close is like bloody good player and like he gets he gets hammered sometimes like and it's just like what like it, it never helps like when when you're hammering people obviously every fan's entitled to their opinion their opinion and stuff but never has like a positive impact and like when I was young like I was young, like I was, I was probably like, I was naive, I was um, vulnerable probably as well, and like, it wasn't, it wasn't a good time for me at all. Um, but yeah, then obviously something clicked and um, things changed, and I actually started to play well, and obviously then probably they started to like me. And In hindsight, it's hindsight's obviously wonderful, but looking back now. What do you think it was, because I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, uh, especially young players now, where social media is such an enormous part of football. Yeah. Why do you think you went searching for information on social media that you almost knew was going to be yeah, negative? I don't know. I don't know. I think everyone's done it, haven't they? I think it's just one of them things where you, you half want to see it, but then you don't like it when you see it. So it never has like a positive outcome I suppose but I don't know I, I obviously so speaking how you are now yeah what advice would you give to yourself in that same situation now yeah just don't even look at it like what someone that probably never played the game or especially not the standard that you know we're playing it at someone's opinion it, it, it just doesn't matter and it's literally not going to affect how you're going to improve or how how you're going to play so it's just not it's not worthwhile to do it it's only going to have like a negative impact on you it might give you a bit of doubt self-doubt and knock your confidence a bit and it literally could be key keyboard warrior and just someone just doing it for shits and gigs like it's just not positive um let's pick it back up a little bit maybe yeah, because, you know deep. yeah <laughs> i am you know i am conscious that you are a premier league player now so <laughs> The next season, you're yeah. in the team. It's you know, it's just you, although you don't get promoted through the playoffs, it is successful. Like the you know, the feeling is better. Yeah. You're in the team, and you obviously feel good. You're playing to a really high level. Um, what are the differences, but you know, between the two, what? How do you feel in that second season where you're pushing for for promotion? Um, well, we did have obviously we had better players. I think that that helped. I think like not slating the club here, but the recruitment, like couple of years prior to that was poor um 
and you know we were never good enough to be anywhere near the playoffs. Um, like like say we'd done well to stay up the year before, but then obviously Paul Cook came in, brought in a lot of players, probably players that should have been playing in League One, high end League One uh, at the time. And um, yeah, I think looking back on it, we should have gone up that year. Um, we had it probably. We, we we obviously we didn't go up. We lost in the playoffs. Um, but yeah, we had enough ability in the squad that year to go up. Um, but there was probably like a, a massive culture change at the club, and everything was done more professionally, I suppose. And and we had a manager that like was very good, who obviously done well at Chesterfield before then. Um, what about um, for you, for specifically for you? What what were the main differences? How did you feel? I'd yeah, like I'd say, like, mate, nutrition like, was a massive part of it. I'd say, like the year before, I wasn't living right. Like you said, I was I was eating whatever I wanted to, whenever, um, not thinking about how it's gonna help me perform and stuff. Um, and then the next year, it was yeah, like like I say, like small things like body fats and stuff. Like you had to be on it because if not, then you. You'd have to do extra sessions and stuff like that and stuff you don't really want to be doing. Um, so that was a big part of it. I'd say my confidence was like sky high compared to the year before. Um, I actually believed in myself and like obviously new players coming in believed in me as well um, because they'd not seen me before. You know, they'd not seen me when I was struggling or wasn't wasn't playing well. Um, was that positively reinforced by things you were seeing on social media at that point? Or how, how did that change? I don't know if I really looked at it then. I, I'm not sure if I I did really take much notice of it then. Um, I think I've probably moved past that by then. It's interesting that you talk about that you searched for it when it was negative, but when yeah. you, probably when it was positive, yeah. you, you didn't go looking. No, I know. So, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember anyway. I don't remember, like, finishing a game and, like, typing my name into Twitter or whatever, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, my confidence was just a lot higher and, like, I knew I was playing well or, or doing well, so I didn't have to go, look, like you said, go looking for someone slating me, you know? People moving on from that season and obviously don't get promoted, but you do move on. A lot yeah. of people without experience of football and, and young players who are hopefully going to have, uh, you know, a, some sort of career will be wondering about what a transfer actually looks like. What are the, you know, what are the specifics? What, how does it feel from, from both sides? So I'm interested to know, um, you know, before you move to Ipswich, can you describe for us how that process works? Yeah, it was rapid to be fair. Um, we played Ipswich in the FA Cup that season. We drew 2-2 two -two at Portman Road, uh, battered them, like absolutely. And they were obviously in the championship at the time we were lead to battered them, um, conceded a late goal to, to take it to 2-2. Two -two. So obviously we had the replay 10 days later. Um, and then we played them in the replay. They played like a second 11, like not their first 11, like they played the first game. Um, I can't remember what the score was, but we won. Um, and played really well again. And then, uh, oh, that was probably like middle of Jan. And then they tried to, by me at the end, like by the end in that window. Um, but obviously we were in the playoffs at the time and obviously wanted to go up. So Pompey said like, no, like they can't let him go now because we, we want to get promoted. Um, so I was a bit gutted, but then I was like, oh, no, it's fine. Like, I, I was happy to stay at that time because like, I actually, we wanted to go up. I wanted to go up. Um, and then I got injured actually. I've done my ankle, got smashed in a tackle. Done my, that's the first time I've done my ankle bad. Um, so I got injured like April. It was a real bad injury. It's probably like a should have probably had an operation, but I didn't. Um, so I got injured in April, and then because we were in the playoffs, like the, obviously the final would have been the end of May. So like it probably would have been like seven. It was like seven weeks away, and like we were like busting the marbles to like try and get back fit for the final, um, which mate it was never gonna happen. Like my ankle was. Fuck, so that was <laughs> never going to happen. Um, anyway, we lost in the semis and then literally the day after we lost, 
think we had meetings with like the manager and then he literally came in I like, came in for mine he said do you want to go like obviously they, he's like they've come in for you do you want to go I was like yeah like I'd like to go like, obviously it's championship football um He's like, yeah, you need to go. You're like, you're ready for it now. Like, you need to go. And he was ledge literally the next day. Drove up there, and I was still injured at the time. Like, I was badly injured, so um, yeah, had like a couple of scans and stuff. Obviously, medical, um, and then ended up probably from like the middle of May till pre-season. I was in like three times a week in Ipswich. And that probably helped me settle in up there a bit as well. So I was like staying in a hotel, coming back at weekends down here and stuff, um, just so I could get fit for pre-season. Um, so I missed like the first week of pre-season and then, yeah, I was fit from there. So that uh, It's interesting that you speak about, obviously they tried to sign you in January. Mm. I'm interested to know what, you know, having that interest in you and then having to stay where you are and continue to play, what did that interest in you do for your football? Yeah, I... I don't actually remember thinking about it that much, but I'd, obviously it, it was nice. Like, I remember I got the phone call, I was obviously living at home still, and I got the phone call, I was like, what? Like, like they want to buy me, like, everything was like 700, no, I don't think they bid 700 grand then, but it was like, fuck, like, I could be going here. Um, and then, to be fair, when it actually did happen in the summer, mate, it was so quick, I didn't have time to think about it. Like, it was literally, as soon as we lost, we, I was gone. Um, but in the Jan, like, I suppose I probably thought that, like, if we don't go up, then I've always got, they'll probably want me anyway. So I was, I just, like, I just wanted to, like, stay fit. And obviously I got injured in April, but I'd played most of the season. So it wasn't like I'd missed a load of games. So it didn't really change change your approach too much? No, I don't think so. I think I just, I, I probably saw it as, like, a win-win. Like, if we go up, obviously I'll be buzzing because we're in League One now. And if we don't, then chances are if I keep doing well, then Ipswich might still want me and I could hopefully go there. And that's what happened, obviously. Have you um, have you ever you know, seen in anybody who's had interest in them from other clubs and for that to have a neg negative effect? Um, yeah, I think when you're young, if that had happened to me maybe a year or two years earlier, mate. I remember actually when I was... 16, 17, like I was playing for England as well. And like when I was training with the first team, I, I remember like my agent telling me maybe like clubs liked me, like big clubs, like in the Prem and stuff. And like it went straight to my head. Like I wasn't like, couldn't deal with it. So I was like, oh, like these want me. And I'd tell like people and like, it's just, like it's, don't do that. Like, why not? Because it's just, they want you like they'll buy you like there's so many times like people will say they like you doesn't mean they want to buy you doesn't mean they want to put money on the table for you like it's not it's not going to have it's not got anything to do with you really like if they like you they like you but you know like agents might tell you something that you want to hear maybe and when I was young like I was like, what? like yes like that's it like I'm, I've made it like, <laughs> which is so wrong like it shouldn't have that mentality like what will be will be if you if you do well enough you'll end up where you, where you should be and um i literally it was just i hadn't even played any games like i was just a kid like getting told oh these clubs in the prem like you like means nothing it means absolutely nothing it's like when you play like when i played for england like 18s and 19s in the long run it, it means nothing like you can some of, some of the best players at that age are not in the game anymore. Like, they're not anywhere. And they're meant to be the next big thing and they're not even in, in the football league, you know? So it, it literally means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you join Ipswich. Yeah. Right, so, you know, you're a championship footballer for the second time. You've already been made an appearance for Portsmouth, but... What did success look like to you at that point? And by that, I mean, was it winning games for Ipswich or establishing yourself as a as a championship player? Um, I think it was probably more establishing myself when I first went there. 
I remember like my mentality like when I was younger I, I just didn't have the belief mate even though I had the belief at Portsmouth when I first signed for Ipswich I was like like I shouldn't be here like these players have all been in the championship for years and like some have been in the Prem and stuff like my mentality was like too weak and not just not didn't have that self belief about myself and I'd be like like I shouldn't so I should. talk to me in detail about how you got over that feeling um I think it only came from like playing obviously I was playing and playing playing well and actually showing that I deserve to be at this level like when I first signed there in pre-season and stuff maybe in like training um I wasn't wouldn't be great and yeah that actually I'll tell you a story so at Ipswich we used to do head tennis for warm up so we'd have like a, a court and the, the nets were like like a tennis it's like a tennis net so it's not like the high ones it's like the low ones and um, we used to do it for a warm up every single day right and my first session obviously I missed like the first week pre-season my first session back in with the boys because my ankle and literally all, all you had to do was there'd be five one end five the other end there'd be two two like courts you like half volley over the net and then you run to the other side. The next person obviously on that side just has to one touch to get it back over. And like, if you don't get it over, then you have to run around like a pole or something. Anyway, mate, I was fucking, I was a nervous wreck. I was a nervous wreck. Right. And I couldn't hit it over. I couldn't get it in. If I'd hit it over, I'd hit it out. And like, Everyone was looking at look at me, and the fitness coach was ruthless, right? Absolutely ruthless. He's a good guy, but he was fucking ruthless. Like Northern just said it how it was. Right? He's like, "We kept the fucking receipt for this fella." <laughs> <laughs> All the lads are just like crying inside. I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm fucking having one here." And literally, I, it was the same thing at Aldershot. My first session at Aldershot, it's like I'd never kicked the ball before. Mate. I'm that. I was that nervous, like. It's, I think I trained like the day before a game as well, the first game of the season. And I was that nervous, mate. I was like, what the fuck? I, I couldn't hack it and like, I couldn't cope with it. Um, so, yeah, that happened at Ipswich. But I got over that like pretty quickly Like when I started actually playing the games. And when you're playing games, it's different and you feel like you're one of the lads then and you, you get over it pretty quick. Was there, I mean, Mick McCarthy, obviously the manager at the time, pretty big deal in football, like, a, a, you know, a bit of a household name. Yeah. How was he with you? And, you know, what did, is there any long lasting, you know, advice or information he gave you that's, that helped you? Yeah, he was really good with me. I think um, he was completely opposite to how I thought he was going to be. Like, I think he has that sort of persona where he's like, screams and shouts and like maybe... 10, 15 years ago, years ago, he was like that. But um, certainly when I was with him, like he was like such a good like man, manage, man manager and like the way he'd speak to you and like he had the respect of everyone, like everyone would go and shake his hand and um, yeah, everyone sort of respected him and wouldn't, wouldn't like do anything to piss him off really. Um, but yeah, he, he helped me obviously he was a centre half and um, no, pretty no nonsense as well so him and uh, Terry Connor his assistant they were they were really good for me they'd always be showing me clips and to be fair sometimes it had like the opposite effect like it wasn't always good um, what do you mean? because I'd they'd, they'd obviously be showing me clips from games that obviously I need to where I need to improve which is fine but then sometimes I'd leave the room feeling like shit on it like I don't feel great after that um, and I remember like like in the changing room like with all the boys and that like the captain Chamber Luke Chambers I'd come back he'd still be in the changing room I'm like fucking hell lads I've just been absolutely hammered in there and then they were like shake their heads like what are they doing why are they doing that to you like you don't need that like just fucking like he's like they were just like just, like don't think you're involved just focus on the game tomorrow like don't worry about it and like yeah like sometimes I would come out of the, the meeting and I'm like fuck me I'm fucking shy <laughs> <laughs> so um, but no in the whole they were brilliant with me because like they helped me adapt to being a championship player and 
they gave me the chance to do that. And if it wasn't for them, then I definitely wouldn't be playing in the Premier League today, for sure. Yep, he sounds like he just got his uh, fitness coach to do all the shouting. Yeah, he definitely did a lot of it. Um, yeah, he was ruthless, mate. Like, you literally wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him, definitely. How, um, during that time that you're talking about being quite challenging and, and obviously feeling nervous, which is something genuine like I can relate to because I've felt that way when I've joined all the clubs mm. that I've been at. But do you remember how you got over that? And, you know, and, and was there any moments that stood, stand out for you as, as you changing the way you felt? No, I think for me, like, time, time is like the best way to get over it. Like, every club I've been at, maybe bar Bristol. Yeah, when I... I suppose, yeah, so when I signed at Ipswich, it took me a while because I thought like I shouldn't be there. Portsmouth, obviously, I came through, so it was a bit different. I, I never really had that. Ipswich, uh, Aldershot, I had that. Like, I was like, fuck, no. I'm nervous wrecking. <laughs> um, but, yeah, when I went to Ipswich, I had a period of time where I was like, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I deserve to be here. I'm not, I know I'm good enough, but I'm not sure I deserve it. Um which is mad think, looking back at it. Um, but then when I went from Ipswich to Bristol, obviously it was the same league. So I knew I I was, I was could play in the championship. And I, I've i probably, I don't know, I think it was like 3.5 mil they paid. So I, I was like, right, yeah, like I, this is me, this is like, this is me now. Like I know I can go again. So when I went, when I signed at Bristol, I never really had, that obviously it was another step up because the players were better and the club was in a better place. But I never really had that where I was proper nervous and like worrying if I should be playing there. But yeah, so I'd say like time and and again then obviously I left Bristol and went to Brighton in the Prem and you then got to prove yourself again. So you got to prove that you can play it in the Premier League. Um, and I'd say like time is like best healer because when you're driving into training every day like I used to get nervous like when I when I first drive into it switch for like I don't know a couple of months maybe or like when I first drive into Brighton for like a couple of months I get nervous just because I'm not like that alpha male like walks into the changing room like loud as fuck and anything like I'm not that guy like it'll take me a bit of time to settle in to places and get comfortable um, so yeah at Brighton I had that definitely um, best way to get over it it's just being spending more time with the boys and like being around being everyone being around everyone for as long as you can I suppose and you only get that with time and after a couple of months then you feel comfortable to maybe speak up and stuff <laughs> um, but yeah You've spoken about your injuries a little bit that you you know you suffered at Ipswich, and the obviously having a look at your career. I know you suffered with injuries during those two seasons, you know ankle problems. Um, but when you were fit, you played. Yeah. So you know we talk to people about injuries all the time, but really like the the direction I want to go with you on this is that how challenging was it for you to get over injuries to get back to the level of fitness or, level or, or, or you know, standard that you needed to, to get straight back into the team, knowing that if you were fit, you were going to get picked. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I was at Ipswich, I, I think I half knew that I would get straight back in straight away, even like after like a week's training. Um, because like, it was never like that sports science mode where they were worried about me getting it re-injured. Or anything, it was like if I'm fit, I'm gonna play. I think, um, I think this year, obviously, I, I injured my ankle in February this this season again, um, my other ankle, and I missed eight eight and a half weeks. And before I got injured, I was like playing really well, flying. Um, and then when I came back, I think I, I, that's probably the hardest I found it because it's at such a high level and get back to the level where I was actually playing at, I found tough. Um, even in training and stuff, it's like, 
it, it, it's not not just like a switch, you know, just like turn it on. Like I found it hard to get back up to speed. Um, and yeah, I was on the bench for one game and then I played after. Um, but yeah, still, it's like you can't really replicate as much as you want to in training. It's different in a game, isn't it? And it's it's harder to get up to speed and um it's not an easy thing to do and everyone thinks it's just like you just oh you're fit now you should be playing well but it's, it can be tough definitely you th it's obvious you talk about after when you get back to the level you, you know you you acknowledge that the period of time in between was challenging mm. but during that time you don't acknowledge it's challenging you just think you should be at that level straight away yeah how um for people obviously dealing with that approach and and for dealing with the issue of trying to regain a certain level or certain standard of football that they've been at after having suffered an injury how best can you do that and how best can you deal with those emotions um good question it's, it's hard because like even now like when we have like a couple of days off like it's, it's like running thing when we have a couple of days off say we have like sunday monday off we're coming on tuesday like you feel awful and like you the standard of training is not as good. Like it just never is. And that no one knows why that is like, can't put a finger on it, but it's hard. Um, and like, yeah, when I was obviously when I was injured for eight and a half weeks, I think I probably expected to just come back and be playing how I was playing before when that was probably pretty naive. And like, it's, it doesn't work like that. Things change. You haven't kicked the ball in so long. And, um, everyone else is still bang at it from when they were before so it's not easy I, I don't really know the answer to that question to be honest I suppose you just gotta grind it out it's not always gonna be you're not always gonna play well every every day and train well every day so you just gotta grind it out and um, try and obviously get back to that level where you were before you were obviously playing at a high level at Ipswich when you were fit um, and the information that I've got, I know you spoke about three and a half million, but I think it was rising to eight million pounds. So, from um, Ipswich to Bristol, from Ipswich to Bristol, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really know to be fair, but yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to know what it was about the Bristol City environment for you that allowed you to play so well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, like I like I said earlier about like the nutrition side, that was a big part. We used to have like. We used to have like this website that they'd give to us, which would have meals and meals and meals and meals and how recipes and stuff. And me and my missus, we used to do quite a lot of them. Um, that definitely helped from that side, that point of view, and just like the strength stuff. Like we, that was the first time I've properly done like leg weights and stuff. And um, we used to have strict um, programs, um, individual programs. Um, so on a Tuesday, say, say typical, our typical week was in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off Thursday, train Friday, obviously play Saturday. So on a Tuesday we would do isometrics in the gym, which would be like bridge holds, Copenhagen holds, um, all isometric, ex isometric exercises, um, after training. And then on the Wednesday, obviously we'd have like a heavier day. We would also do um, two top speed sprints um, to prevent like your hamstring injuries. Um, is that mine? That's mine. Is it? Um, In the corner. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do two like top speed sprints, um, which is massive because if you think about it, in training you might not sprint full pelt, and then when you come to a game, you you all of a sudden want to sprint full pelt, and then your hamstring goes. Um, I think that's a big way of preventing that and that's like the first time I've ever done that um, and then so after training then we would do leg weights so we do like trap bar deadlifts do Nordics big one um, we do a lunge like a reverse lunge and we'd also do like a sissy squat four exercises like plain and simple but on the trap bar we'd it would all be recorded so that we'd had we used to have like these things called like jimmy so it's like a an attachment around the bar linked to an ipad 
So it measures like you type in the weight where you've got it on and it measures your power and you've got to get above like a certain amount. And then so one week, you, say you do 120 kg, next week you do 125, then you do 130, then you do 140 and then you stop it at 140 and then you'll have like a deload week. And like that was massive because we had no hamstring injuries that season and like I struggled with my hamstrings before. I used to get one like every season. Um, and that was like massive because it, it gave me the chance to train every day play I played like 47 games that season which is the most I've ever played um, so that was that was a big difference for me because like at Ipswich fair enough like that's just not how they do it like they they didn't do the sports science side of it but I think like nowadays you sort of have to because of how tough the schedules are and how much like load it is you need to know exactly how much like the players are doing and training and and in games um so that was yeah and it's similar at brighton now we, we do that, all of that stuff and it definitely helps it's interesting that you talk about what helped you reach a higher level for you it wasn't really anything to do with football or your technical ability it's the nutrition the gym work things that are attainable for most people to be able to do. Yeah. Do you think training to that level of intensity is attainable for guys who aren't playing football at that level and are playing at a lower level? Yeah, definitely. I think anyone can learn how to eat right and train properly, like as in off the field. Like I'm not sitting here and saying that that was the only reason because the manager, Lee Johnson, and the coaches, Dean Holden and um, Jamie McAllister, they were big in my development as well like we used to do clips as a team instead of like because I've gone from Ipswich where it was just me and then we used to go from doing clips as a team where we can all improve and that that w that helped because it didn't feel like they were singling you out I guess um, and also like a big well not a big one but another way of improving me like when I first signed at Bristol City like Lee Johnson um, obviously was the manager and um, he used to in pre-season he used to like we used to wear a GPS vest he used to put like a microphone on one of them so like he'd listen to like what you're saying so like I might wear it for 45 minutes and like Marlon Pack might wear it for 45 minutes and like when you when you know that you've got that microphone on mate you don't stop talking it's mental like you're literally because you know that they're listening so he would watch the game back next day with the microphone at the same time as the game so he could see what you're saying and from then like I feel like and then he did so that was in pre-season so it was a bit like oh, he's only doing it in pre-season mate he chucked it on me the first away game in the season QPR away I was like fucking hell like <laughs> chucked it on me like literally 10 minutes before the game I was like fucking hell. I was half raging but then like when I'm when I'm like in the game mate, I'm I'm vocal is like being so vocal and anything in it and that it it makes you concentrate more and that definitely helped and I feel like since then especially now with no fans and stuff like it's easy to be quite vocal and um you've got no excuse because you can you can speak to your mate 50 yards away whereas when the fans are and you can't do that um so that that probably helped a lot in my game as well because I became big talker um, whereas probably wouldn't have done it before so what are the biggest differences between Aldershot Adam Webster and the Adam Webster that Brighton paid 22 million pounds for um, um, well I know how to look after my body now I say like when I was all the shot I didn't definitely didn't know how to do that like even like sleep and stuff yeah that's another one sleep when I was at Ips like obviously all the shot as well I wouldn't have done it then but when I was at Ips which I used to go to bed like half 11 12 sometimes like, I'd watch TV until 11 o'clock religiously like just because I thought that was what I, was, what I did and then I'd go up to bed at half 11 and then probably go to bed at 12 as soon as I went to Bristol I don't know why not sure why, but I used to go to bed at like half nine, ten. 
and then I feel so much better. Like I used to, I I used to get up later at Ipswich to be fair, but I still went to bed like half eleven. It was just too late, and I never like realized how much sleep helps and how important it is. Um, like these are all little things that I've changed like along the way. Um, but the difference, I'd say, yeah, I know how to look after my body. I'd say a lot more. Know what things I need to be doing to make get myself right for the weekend. Um, and yeah, I, I back myself now. <laughs> like I don't, I don't doubt myself like I used to, and um, that is massive for me. That is, that is a big, big change. We've spoken about it a little bit. How you talk about how you feel when you enter a new environment. And people listening, you know, young players, football fans, uh, you know, normal normal people, we've all experienced walking into a new room or a new changing room, a new job, um, you know, at least once in our lives. Knowing what you do now, like, what is your experiences, you know, of, of, of that moment and, and what sort of advice can you give to people who are about to do that? Um, yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Because it's like, when you, like, if you're starting at a new school, like, it's... It's always like the worst day ever. Like it's it's so hard, especially like even when you join a new club. Like it's tough, it's really tough. Um, because them them players might have been there for years together and they know each other inside out, and you're turning up and don't know anyone. Like to be fair, most yeah, every club I've joined I didn't know anyone that I've gone that like, I've gone there with. Um, so it's hard, but yeah, I, I guess you've just got to try and get involved. Really, I think you sort of sit on the sidelines a bit too much and you can get left behind and um yeah get forgotten about i suppose so i think you got to try and you don't want to be one of them people that are too loud and like you know you know them people i'm talking about like when you turn out you don't want to be people thinking oh, who the fuck's he? like, he's just <laughs> fucking got it like at least, like just chill like you want to be chilled but you obviously you also want to get involved and um yeah, not be too shy, I suppose. What were the immediate differences that you saw when you joined Brighton? Like, can you remember your first, I know obviously you've talked about being nervous for your first training session and stuff, but what, you know, what players stood out to you the most and, and what were your immediate thoughts? Yeah, i say it's just like another level again. Like like I said earlier, from like Ipswich to Bristol was like a step up in terms of like the standards every day and that. Um and then from, yeah, Bristol to Brighton, obviously the quality is just, like, next level. It's, like, it's, it's like, a couple of seconds sharper. Um, everything's sharper. Um, and, yeah, that, that's, like, the main difference, like, the training standard is... When you say everything's sharper, like, what, yeah. what do you mean? Like what's, what, what's quicker, what's sharper? Like, physically, probably people are quicker, um, but mentally it's just like someone knows their next pass someone knows where you are they know like what side to pass to and like where their next pass is and everything about it's just um quicker and obviously the quality is um yeah it's the quality is higher and um everyone's like at it every day like to be fair this season we've stepped up even more in terms of training like the standard is a joke every single day and um people demand so much from each other um it can get heated at times obviously because you know what it's like but in the day it's all to like try and improve help everyone improve um but yeah i'd say it's just like the standard of like the one touch passing and um people knowing and, and and people's ability like that's why they're playing in the Premier League because of the ability they have and um, yeah it's, it's just everything's just that next level up can you remember any moments where you you know where you thought like wow these or this guy or, or these guys are a joke um, yeah I think just like probably just tra- like training with Dunkey like he obviously I'd watched him for years anyway like in the champ and just from watching him play. Um, and then, like, when you train with him and, that, and he's, like, chucking himself every 
every shot and blocking. And it's like some of the blocks he makes, and you're like, how the fuck does he make that block? And it's like, but I need to like try and learn from that and um, add that to my game. Um, so I yeah, I just say like little things like that, and you're just like, wow, like it's, it's mad. Um, nothing, you, nothing too particular stands out. You. Lewis Duncan and Ben White in particular obviously have sort of formed the the back three almost of, you know, a real sort of staple in Brighton's team this year. What kind of dynamic do the three of you have, especially all three as, as young players still? Um, and how, how comfortable has that been for you playing with those two? Yeah, really good. I think obviously watching Ben last year at, at Leeds, um, knew how well he'd done and how good he was. Um, and then obviously he came back to us in the summer and I think when you have that bit of extra competition, I think everyone steps up as well, definitely. Um, and then we played more of a four last season. We played three a few times. Um, but then obviously this year to play a three, it, it definitely suits us to the ground because we all sort of complement each other. Um, and we're all like big enough to take it on the chin. If so, like if, I've, if Dunkey's got something to say to me, I'll take it or the other way like with Ben like we're we're not like characters where we're gonna fall out we're all pretty chilled out um characters with Dunky he's not that chilled out on the pitch but um but yeah we're all pretty chilled out and um yeah like I say we complement each other really well like Dunky's obviously in the middle me and Ben on the, on the laterals and and sort of um can like step in with the ball more and um yeah, that that definitely is. is a, it's been a great partnership and a great way of how we've played. Nachos must have been a word you've learned at Brighton. Yeah, definitely. Gaffer <laughs> loves that one. Before we move on, um, I'm interested to. So, the three of you, obviously playing as young footballers do, uh, are now so progressive and and uh, are playing a certain standard of football that is now modern day. Mm -hmm. I watched the game last year that you played in. Uh, away at Bournemouth and as a team so yeah I don't remind you as a team you guys were in complete control of that game um, I remember being quite close to the pitch so the, the, the speed of the ball um, for, for you guys in, in particular was, was pretty impressive mm -hmm. you end up being 2-0 down at half time how difficult is it for you in this Brighton team at the moment who I think everybody can agree play tremendous football to struggle results wise, how challenging is it to, to buy into something and not get results and to continue doing that? Yeah, it, it can be tricky. Um, that game in particular, because it was like the back end of the season, obviously we're both struggling. Um, and that, that was probably one of our biggest, that was probably our biggest low of last season when we come off the field. Like we thought we were in the shit because like you say, we were in control for the first half an hour of the game. Too too easy at times. That complete control, yeah. Too easy, and then you get a sucker punch, and then before you know, you're two nil down. And probably we lost three one, I think it was, wasn't it? And it might have even been three nil. We'll get one back in the end, but um, it was three one. I think three one. Moy scored a, yeah. a nice goal. Yeah, um, yeah, it's hard, but then what you got to say to yourself is how do you get the result if you don't play well you can't expect to get any result if you if you don't play well so there's been t a lot of times this year where we should have taken all three points um a lot of games like i can think of like five off the top of my head um and the margins are so small in, the, in this league and that that is um why it is so tough um but for us like Throughout the whole season, our performances have been pretty good in the main. It is frustrating because, you know, like you say, team, people do say, like, you're a really good team, but you're just, like, you're missing something. And it is it is frustrating. Um, but for us, like, we just have to try and play as well as we can. Um, and then hopefully the results do come. And, and they have, obviously, we're, we're in the Prem again next year, and they have... Um, enough but obviously we we want to kick on and next year we don't want to have that hanging over us and um we really want to push on and like i said the margins are so small and we definitely believe that we can 
you know, make it into the top 10 next season. And, um, yeah, kick on. Before we finish, mate, um, there's something I want to talk about, is in, in obviously, that you've experienced during your Brighton career because whilst you've got to, you, you know, yourself to a level where you're an important Bright, Brighton first-team player, um, you're being linked to, you know, to the England team, there's also been moments within that that you're, the style of play that you guys um, obviously are asked to play has gone badly for you in particular mm -hmm. uh, and mistakes that you've made that have led to goals conceded. Um, I want to know how difficult is that for you to to deal with those mistakes um, and what do you do to, to deal with them? Yeah, tough. Um, it's been hard for me personally because... Every club I've gone to, Ipswich, Bristol and Brighton, I've always gone and replaced like, not replaced, well, yeah, replaced, like a fan's favourite. So like, went to Ipswich, Tommy Smith was the centre-half with Christoph Bearer and Tommy Smith's from Ipswich, like, come through the academy there. And I've signed and replaced him, basically. Went to Bristol, Aidan Flinch just left like legend in Bristol City. Um, so I've replaced him. And then I've signed for Brighton and like I'm in the team over Shane Duffy and he got player of the season the year before and obviously got promoted to them. Been like one of the best players for them in the Prem. Um, so like from a fan's point of view, like they're like, who's this guy? Like <laughs> he's replacing like our favorite, our favorite player. So it, it has been tough. And like you say, like, I made some mistakes last year, which led to goals, and the margins are small. So if I didn't do that, obviously we might have picked up some more points. But the way we play, like it's gonna happen at times, and um, the manager is fine with that. That's why he. he gives us the freedom and the confidence to go out and play the way we do. Um, so, yeah, it, it is tough because you obviously do get a bit of stick and stuff. And um, yeah, Last season, I had low points where I wasn't high on confidence um, and you know, get a bit of stick still, but I'm more resilient now and I can I can deal with it. And um, to be fair, the lockdown helped me because it gave me a chance to like switch off from all of that and give me a good break and then since I came back from the lockdown I was fresh I was flying in training and then I took that into the games and um, yeah didn't look back since then I suppose incredibly excitable mate um, we're gonna I'm gonna finish with some quick fires so I'm just gonna roll oh, yeah. them out to you see uh, how you do um, your best ever performance in your opinion um, it's not very quick this is it but uh, my best ever performance. Liverpool, I'm going to just say it just for the result. Liverpool uh, uh, Liverpool away this year. We beat them 1-0. Um, got I actually got man of the match that game, believe it or not. It's my first man of the match, age Was 26. Yeah. yeah, 26 years old, first one. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that one. We've obviously beat them at, at Anfield, which was a special night. And memorable, obviously, because of first ever man of the match. First ever ever man, yeah. The most dip difficult moment you've had to deal with? Um, difficult moment. There's loads in there. <laughs> There's a lot. Um, probably one of the most difficult was when I was at Pompey and I was like getting pelters, mate. The team was having one. I was not playing well. Um, yeah, I think it was Boxing Day. We played Wimbledon. I played right back, got back in the team, played right back, and we lost 2 0 or something on Boxing Day. Booed off the pitch, everything. Like, that was, and that's one of the days where I got hammered after. <laughs> I got a fucking hell. Um, so, yeah, probably like, I'd, off the top of my head, I'd say something like that. The best advice anybody's ever given to you? Um, we used to have a coach at, at Pompey when he was our under-16s coach. He was a legend. He's passed away now. Um, John Perkins. And he used to say, like, it's it's hard to stay in the game 
uh, no, it's hard to. It's like it's hard to get a contract, but it's harder to stay in the game, and that is so true. Like I said earlier, you see so many players that might you know play for England, or make their debuts. Like I've seen a lot of players make their debuts, and then in a year, two years time, they're nowhere to be seen, like not even in the game. And it is so true to stay in the game, stay at a, a high level is is so hard, and um, yeah, that I'll always remember that. What are the top three things you need to be able to do to play in the Premier League? Um, I would say you need to be quick, but not everyone is quick in the Premier League. But yeah, the, the pace is so fast. Um, you physically, you need to be strong, quick. Um, you need to, obviously, technically, you need to be able to handle the ball because... Like most week, most of the week in training, won't head a ball once. Like it's, everything's on the floor. Like get to a game and you got to head it, and like you get after the game, you might get sore head because you actually haven't headed the ball. In a I week. wonder why you cut your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously technically you've got to be able to to handle the ball, and um, yeah, the games are so like physically demanding now you've got to be able to cope with them and so yeah you've got to live right and, so. um toughest opponent you've ever faced um I get asked this so many times um it's like everyone expects you to say like aguero <laughs> or someone like that um but he's like he never comes near you he's not really asked until he gets in the box um jimenez is very good very good, like, holds the ball up, wins headers, doesn't stop working. Um, Harry Kane, obviously, is really very good player. Um, but, yeah, I always say, normally say Jimenez. I'm not sure if you gave me 10, 10 attempts at guessing who, who you'd say I'd have, I'd have put him in there. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Like, everyone ex expects you to say, like, Kane or Aguero yeah. or... Well, I don't know. To be fair, Sterling, like Sterling's, Sterling and Salah, like their movement is frightening. It's like it's a step quicker than what you think, and it's hard to deal with. But in terms of like actually head to head, Jimenez has given me some tough games. What advice would you give to a young Adam Webster? Um, just believe more. Like give give yourself. Um, don't be too hard on yourself um, and yeah just believe more that you can you can do it because if you don't then literally no one else is going to do it for you so um, have that confidence in yourself and um, yeah that's it I suppose current career ambition uh, well yeah I'd love to play for England one day um, I think I was obviously playing well um, earlier on in the season before I got injured I'm not saying I would have been in the squad because I'm not saying that at all but I would have liked to have obviously stayed fit and given myself the best chance of making a squad um, but yeah moving forward obviously I want to um, keep improving and hopefully one day I might be able to get that How mad is that from where you've come come yeah, from to, would, to say that? That would be mad obviously I'm, I, I still feel that I'm um fair bit away from that yet I think um, if I can get to a level that Dunk like I'm not just saying this because he's in my team and my captain that, but Dunky is unbelievable and I think he should be in the squad and um, yeah if I can get to a level that he's performing at now then I'll give myself a, a good chance Which manager has had the biggest influence on you? I think probably the current man. I'm not just, obviously not just saying this as well because he's my actual manager now. But like he's made me understand the game a lot more, and like the the way he sets us up for every game, it's it's always different, but it's always to beat the opposition and like the meetings we have to prepare us for the game 
is actually mental how much preparation goes into it and um we know whenever we step on the pitch like exactly what we're doing and i've never had it that intense before and it helps so much because like i said the opposition are so good like without that you're going to be struggling you're going to be up against it already so yeah the fact the way he sets us up and the way he gives us the the best chance to go and win is um mental and tactically it's like it helps so much i said they were quick fire but they're more, more slow they're fire not, but not this quick. is the last yeah. one mate um what advice would you give to young players now who are aspiring to become footballers um i would say brutal but not everyone's going to make it like it this literally like the one percent and so you've got to be different you've got to stand out you've got to work harder than everyone else because nothing's given to you um you've got to earn everything and yeah there's like there's no shortcuts to the top so um you've got to abs- like bust your balls for as long as you can Appreciate it, mate. Webby, thank you so much for your time. No worries. Loads of gold in there. Yeah. Thank you very much, pal. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, mate. Guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Adam Webster as much as I did and have some lessons and takeaways to put into your game and try at training tomorrow. Remember to subscribe, like and review this show via your podcast channel and press the bell button so you never miss a release if you're watching us on YouTube. Head to the ePerform website for even more football-specific information and subscribe to our mailing list to get all the best actionable advice straight to your inbox for free. I'm Joe Partington. See you soon.